Neonic Horror Productions presents. Hello, welcome to Book Watchers. I'm your host, Jacob. Today, of course, I'm joined, as always, with founder, CEO, whatever self-imposed titles uh, he's given himself. <laughs> the Gaylord CEO on our Discord. Duh, it's me. It's yo bitch. Devin, hi. How are you? It, is cer- it certainly is a bitch. Uh, that is disrespectful, you old man. Old? Yeah. You're, old. what, 31? Old, crusty, and dusty, okay? Bitch, please. I'm not even 30 yet. And you sure act like it. <sighs> ooh. And, uh, ooh. Ooh. I'm and sorry, which one, of a, which one of us almost fell down yesterday? I did not almost fall. I did not almost fall down. Motherfucker, I swear. Oh, oh, I will drive over Mm -hmm. to your house and I will beat your ass. Mm -hmm. I know where you live. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. What the Mm -hmm. fuck we doing today? Also, in the description, in the fucking description below, if you want to fucking follow us on. YouTube or like the other podcasts of Neon Void Productions, the link in descriptions will be in the um description below, as well as a little note saying Jacob, you better watch yourself and we'll beat that ass. Um that'll be dated. Yeah, <laughs> that's that. That's that. So what do we what do we what are we doing today outside of listening to that's your a- ass? Oh, outside of the murder? Yeah. Uh, murder. Well, yeah, so today we are sadly going to be reviewing the final book in the Green Creek novels. <sighs> I say then... sadly because this was definitely one of the book series that I love so much that when I finished it, I was sad. Like, oh, I want more. <laughs> I want more. <laughs> but... <laughs> This is the uh this book is the marks the end of the Green Creek novels. Uh of course this book the title of book four is called Brother's Song. Yeah. And Brother's Song, I definitely wanna like I I just want to note that this this book is more oriented around the the family itself. Uh-huh. It's less about the relationship between the main character the main character of the book. And like his romant his romantic relationship with um the other uh with his of course love interest. Um so Brother Song is def- is a um is centered on the oldest of the Bennett sons, uh Carter Bennett. Um throughout the other three books, Carter has always been this like not so much solitary figure, but he was always this big, overprotective big brother. He was always ready to jump into a fight for anybody in his family. Um, he's loud, he's brash, but he's so lovable. And uh, near the uh, towards the conclusion of the previous book, Heart Song, uh, Carter realizes that his. Uh, his true mate was actually the Timberwolf, who turns out to be the son of their arch enemy. Um, the Timberwolf's real name is Gavin Livingstone. Yeah. And uh, his dad is uh, was the for- uh, was the former Dark Witch, Robert Livingstone. Um, at the end of the last book, 
Carter made a decision to go after Gavin because Gavin, in or in an effort to protect Carter and the rest of the Bennets, he chose to go with. Um, he chose to go with his father, who at that point be had turned into a demon alpha werewolf. So I say demon alpha. I see a a demon werewolf because unlike the other werewolves who just turn into giant horse-sized wolves he transforms into a bipedal werewolf hy- like wolf hybrid when he transforms uh-huh. in. and um, just if you want a visual just think of the Va- uh, Van Helsing when he turned into a werewolf yes but this werewolf is was very he was very uh Livingstone is very powerful because he when he turned into a werewolf he ended up killing uh Alpha Michelle Hughes taking on her alpha powers which made him even stronger and uh I guess he had some leftover magic uh when he transformed because no the Bennets weren't able to do anything to hurt him even though they tried like attacking biting scratching uh, nothing could pierce his skin. Uh, the only thing that they were able to do uh, was gouge out his eye. But that was it. Um, so at the end of the book, Carter decided to cut his ties with the pack and go after Gavin. And this segues into the beginning of this book, where Carter had spent a little over a year tracking down Gavin. Um, In that year, Uh Carter is slowly descending into uh, madness because a werewolf without a pack begins to essentially lose touch with their humanity and become more feral. And they become what is called an Omega. An Omega werewolf is a werewolf without a pack, and they are more feral and more animalistic. And um, in the most ex- in the most extreme case, they completely lose themselves to their wolves and spend the rest of their lives as a giant wolf, out of control and very uh, ferocious. Um, Gavin had at one point been just that; he was only in his wolf form, and until the last book, when Livingstone turned into a werewolf and almost killed Carter and the rest of the Bennets. But Gavin was able to find his humanity again and transform back and uh, stop Livingstone and agreed to leave with him just to protect the Bennett back. Mm-hmm. Um, so now... <clears throat> so Carter spends a total of 13 months tracking down Gavin. Um, he does While he's looking for him, he does find notes from Gavin telling him to leave him alone and go home. But Really, it only sp- it only uh, spurns Carter to keep going. Um, there are t- there are moments where he's slowly losing himself. Uh, he's even begins seeing hallucinations of his younger brother Kelly. Um, he and Kelly had a very close relationship. Um, as I mentioned before, the werewolves can also have emotional tethers with specific people, and for. Carter, his emotional tether was Kelly. So aside from the pack keeping him in touch with his humanity, Kelly uh, also acts as that firm anchor to his uh, to his humanity. So, but since he since he cut all those ties, he's slow. Uh, he's losing himself. He's seeing hallucinations of his brother, who is beginning to taunt him and become more uh this hallucination is becoming more and more aggressive towards him like like really bad like really bad case of like disassociation disorder i think that mm-hmm. would be the uh correct term i'm not a psychologist so don't come for me <laughs> uh uh at one point this is something that carter still doesn't isn't sure if he saw was thought was real or if it was just a hallucination he meets this psychic woman who helps lead him on the right path towards gavin um when he meets her she was set up inside like a little strip like a little shop uh and when he talks to her and she tells him gives him words of wisdom like you need your pack again go 
get you're very close to Gavin, blah blah blah. She he leaves, but when he looks back at the shop, the shop is empty. Like as if nobody's been in the shop for years. So he wasn't sure if it was speaking to a real person or if it was just a hallucination. Um, later, he finds out that that was actually, he was probably visited by the spirit of his great-grandmother, who was a psychic. And uh, his mom showed him a picture of the woman, and he's like, that's her. And she's like, oh, she's been dead for almost 100 years. And oh. And yep. So Carter eventually finds Gavin. Um, Gavin had fled to his childhood home uh and that's where he's been hiding and also where he has been trying to keep livingstone uh hidden as well because since livingstone follow uh is following gavin uh gavin thought it'd be better to find the most isolated place he can think of and his childhood home was uh is way out in like the in the country there's plenty of trees there's hardly any person any living pe- like there's hardly anybody around for miles. So it's the perfect place for him to keep Livingstone out of the way. Um, and since Gavin just stays there, Livingstone doesn't go anywhere. Um, Gavin is, to say the least, pissed that Carter managed to find him and keeps trying to, and he keeps trying to tell Carter to go home. But Carter refuses, saying that he's not leaving without him. And uh, Carter spends a couple weeks there with Gavin. Um, He's trying to regain Gavin's trust. Uh, he notices Gavin, even though he's in, he's able to take his human form again, he's still somewhat feral. He's not able to form, like, coherent. Like, he's not really able to talk very well. Spending years in his wolf form has caused him to develop, to develop a slight speech impediment. So he can only, so he can really talk only in, like, short, broken sentences. Um, he's still very gruff and kind of animalistic but overall carter is relieved to have found uh found gavin again because uh like i said gavin is his true mate and he's not about to let him he's not about to let him go uh while uh while he's there um livingstone almost kills carter but gavin steps in and tells him to leave carter alone um carter learns a little bit more about Gavin's past, uh, especially that Gavin was the son of of Robert Livingstone's mistress and Tether. Uh, But when she got uh, pregnant, the Bennett pack got involved and they convinced her to take the baby away and give it up for adoption. Like they were trying to keep things, they were trying, they were more or less trying to mediate things between Livingstone and his family because, uh, it was a very, it was, was this was during a very tumultuous time because, uh, Livingstone's wife, uh, wife and Gavin's older brother's mother, uh, she was losing her, she was starting to, slowly lose her mind because Livingstone had been uh, manipulating her memories and altering, like, just fucking with her mind. And she was becoming very emotionally and mentally unstable. Uh, So when the pack found out that Livingstone had another, uh, had gotten his mistress pregnant, they didn't want to, they didn't want this to, like, come back and affect uh, Gordo or his mother. So they convinced her to uh, to leave and to give the child up for adoption, and that was Ga- and that child was Gavin. So Gavin ended up growing up with a normal family. Um, we also find out later in the book that uh, Thomas Bennett uh, tracked down Gavin and told him about the world of werewolves and witches. Um, Gavin had even asked Thomas to turn him into a werewolf because he felt like this is where he this is the world he belongs in. But Thomas, he refused because, for one thing, uh, Gavin is still a witch, and witches cannot take, cannot become werewolves because uh, their magic will reject the magic of the wolf, and you can either, like, bad things happen. Typically, they die, but Gavin ended up finding another alpha werewolf to turn him. But when he did, he there were uh there was a backlash. Gavin became a 
lost to his werewolf, uh, to his wolf almost immediately. And he pretty much spent the entire time as an Omega and in his wolf form. So he spent years as a wolf. And it's only now that because he has Carter in his life that he's able to find his humanity again. So it's a very weird, it's a very odd case. And it's defying everything they know about the witch and wolf relationship. But other than that, Carter's still working on trying to convince Gavin to leave uh, Livingstone. He says it doesn't matter what happens. They'll figure a way to deal with Livingstone in the future. But Gavin refuses to leave because um, he's, still, he's still, in his own way, staying there to keep everyone else safe. Uh, but Carter becomes more concerned for Gavin because Gavin would... Because Livingstone wasn't, like, in the in the house with them. He was out in the woods. There's, like, a cave uh, not far from uh, Gavin's childhood home. And he's just been hiding there the entire time. And mm -hmm. Carter notices that every now and then Gavin will leave and go to that cave. And he finally follows Gavin to the cave. And he sees Livingstone doing something to Gavin. Um, it looked like he had Gavin pinned down and uh, he noticed that like it was almost as if Livingstone was feeding off of Gavin. So like some for some for whatever Ew. reason, not that way. No, not what No. You you're the one that's gross. I was not thinking that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. It's not. That's his son. Why would I do that? I don't know. People tend to take things to that place. You took it there. I didn't. I just said it was like, why are you devout? Why are you feeding on your son? You're the one yeah, that took it so, to a weird place. <laughs> so he's not actually like feeding, feeding on him, like like taking bites out of him and things like that. Um, Livingstone still has some magic. He's not able to cast spells anymore. But considering his demon wolf form is. Uh, Unlike anything the uh, anything that's ever been seen before, the demon wolf is uh, somehow able to draw, like, siphon the life force of the omegas and the betas in his pack. So he was, for some reason, Livingstone begins doing that to Gavin, and uh, it answers some questions that Carter had, because um, every time Gavin would go to Livingstone, the next day he'd come back and he was like very drained and very weak. So um, he's not, he's still trying to figure out what to do. But uh, the thing is, is that Carter is, even though he's found Gavin again, having Gavin in close proximity to him, him is helping to uh, stave off the full transformation into uh, an Omega. His uh, Carter is still slowly descending into that madness that, that develops when you become an Omega. And um, he's pretty much at that at the brink of crossing that line at this point. Um, but before uh -huh. that happens, uh, Carter is found by his younger brothers, Kelly and Joe. Uh, so they finally oh. track him down. And Joe, being an alpha werewolf, is able to bring Carter back from the brink and help recenter him. Uh, they immediately, they basically force him to rec uh, reconnect the bonds to his pack because, you know, that's what brothers do. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, so the, his brothers immediately chew him out for his decision to just cut ties with everybody. Um, Carter didn't cut ties with his pack just because, like, you know, fuck you guys, I don't want to be here anymore. But it was more of like, I need to do this on my own. He felt like he needed to do, he needed to find Gavin on his own, and he did. And since it was such a dangerous thing, because it involved Livingstone, uh, he didn't want to endanger endanger his family any further. But that's that's the thing about family is that you don't just leave them behind like that because they're gonna want to help you no matter what. Uh huh. And they told him that, and they told him that they'll deal with Livingstone because they had a plan. Uh, so when Gavin returns and they tell, they talk to him about it, they tell him what they're planning on doing. He agrees to return to Green Creek with, uh, the Bennetts and 
when they begin when they get ready to leave uh livingstone can sense that gavin is about to leave and immediately comes running uh but before he can chase them down and like uh kill and kill the shit out of the bennett boys uh the bennett's had been working on gathering a small force of uh, allied witches and once they tracked Livingstone down they gathered those witches together and I'd say there was about 30 witches that they were able to gather and these witches cast a uh, binding spell around Livingstone so uh, the land surrounding uh, Gavin's childhood home they created a barrier that traps that trapped Livingstone inside so he's no longer oh. able to leave but the problem is, is that it's not something. It's not like a activate and forget. The witches have to stay, have to stay behind and keep an eye on him and make sure that the wards stay up. Um, so that's what they end up doing. It was all part of their plan, and they take both Carter and Gavin back home uh, to Green Creek. Uh, let's see, let's see. Okay, got a trap. Blah blah blah. So they're taken back to green creek and the two of them work to rebuild the bonds with their pack again um carter is basically on a redemption tour he has to uh work with everybody in the pack uh to rebuild the the pack bonds and to make amends a lot of people were pissed at him um his mom was understanding his younger brother kelly was pissed joe was pissed but somewhat understanding ox was uh Alpha zenning out, so he like was so basically completely unbothered. Like he knew. <laughs> it's funny because uh, throughout the entire series, there's a running joke that uh, Ox, uh, since becoming an alpha, has now adopted the philosophy of alpha zen, which is like uh, being an alpha. He's somehow unbothered by the un the shenanigans of his pack and is able to like maintain his composure regardless mm. which it's kind of funny because that's something he picked up from uh his adopted father thomas because thomas yeah. did the same thing and gerald tries to do the same thing tries to do it too but somehow ox is doing a better job <laughs> but yeah either way they spend some time uh some quality time in green creek rebuilding those bonds uh the uh the, the Bennett's helped Gavin to build stronger bonds with the pack by including him in a lot of their family uh traditions like every Sunday they have a a family dinner so he's always a part of that uh Gordo shop uh Gordo decides to take Gavin on in his sh uh, as like a an assistant in his shop Mm -hmm. and uh even gives him a shirt embroidered with uh his own name on it and uh gavin as it turns out really likes the color pink so gordo gave him a pink shirt with his name on it which was kind of oh. which is really cute which is really cute because usually those shirts are like a navy blue yeah and so it, everything they do is to help strengthen Gavin's bond with the pack because before, even though he was technically a part of the pack, he was still an Omega. But now they really need to do that. Be they really need to strengthen the bond with him because uh, since he left with Livingstone and Livingstone was a Alpha, uh, Livingstone still has some kind of hold over him. So they got to do everything they can to weaken that uh, alpha pack bond with Gavin. So he doesn't have any, so Livingstone can't do anything to influence or to control Gavin. Uh, Carter ends up spending more time with his brothers uh, and making amends with them because aside from the guilt he feels for leaving Kelly behind, he also has been carrying around a lot of guilt concerning his youngest brother, Joe. Because uh, as you may recall, Joe was kidnapped as a young child by a rogue werewolf named Richard Collins. And Richard had Joe, had taken Joe captive for about seven to eight weeks. And in that time, he brutally tortured uh, Joe. So it was like, 
and he was very sadistic too because he would uh he would call Joe's father Thomas and while and he would make Thomas listen to uh him torturing his son so it was a very traumatic experience for him and Carter was carrying his own guilt over that because the day that Joe was taken um he technically was supposed to be watching Joe but while Carter being uh just being a teenager back then not wanting to be uh you know followed around by his kid brother he ditched his brother to go hang out with his friends and Joe got lost in their old pe- uh had got uh lost and that's when Collins had found him and taken him so he Makes he want he wants to make amends. He wants to like he comes clean and tells uh, Joe like I've about the guilt he's been carrying. But Joe tells him that he never once blamed or hated Carter for what happened. You know he understands like yeah it was just we were just kids we didn't know like we didn't uh, know that there was a monster live uh there was a monster that would have taken me. So. It's very, like, I appreciate this book because it's not so much focused on the romance between uh, Carter and Gavin, but it was more focused on the bonds between their family and how pretty much by the end of this book, they are so much stronger and so much closer. And it's very, it's wholesome. I, I gotta say, it's wholesome as fuck. I love it. Um... The thing is, even though they have uh, Carter and Gavin back, there's still there is still the very very troublesome problem, uh, concerning problem of Robert Livingstone because they need to figure out what they're going to do with him because they can't keep him in that prison forever. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And one of the things they need to do is make sure that Livingstone isn't able to lay claim to Gavin again. And to do that, they need to make sure Gavin is completely 100% a part of the Bennett pack. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me. Choked. Sorry, choked a little bit. Uh, wow. And, well, <laughs> they had... Uh, Carter's mom, Elizabeth, ends up sitting the two of them down uh to have a conversation with them and tells them listen i love you both all right but you know when uh when one werewolf loves another very much they have sex and become mates very awkward conversation but you uh-huh. know coming from but you know what that's what moms are for awkward conversations facts but she so the only way really the only surefire way to make sure that gavin is no longer under any kind of control uh from his father uh carter needs to man up and make gavin his 100 percent. and uh it's around this point that elizabeth decides to give gavin a letter that was written by Carter's dad, Thomas. Now, let me tell you something. These letters, oh God, I love them. So, uh, I read the last one. Uh, I read the first one in the uh, previous episode. It was the letter that Thomas Bennett wrote for Kelly to give to his future partner. Um, and now, uh, Elizabeth decided that it was probably the best time for her to give gavin and carter the letter written for carter's future partner and uh, gavin asks her to read it out for them because since uh he's still uh getting back in touch with his humanity he's not really able to comprehend written words just yet he's still struggling with his speech impediment and everything uh so she agrees and she ends up reading him the letter uh, to which I will go ahead and read to you guys now. All right, let me just get that letter up. So, 
I just want to say the letters written to uh, for Carter and Kelly's partners, while very sweet and emotional, are nothing compared to the final letter, which was written for Joe's partner. And I will also that letter is also uh, is also presented in this book. Uh, I'll be reading that towards the very end. And let me tell you, that one made me cry. Yeah. It it did, like, straight, like, I was bawling my eyes out. But uh, anyway, so, uh, Kelly, and uh, I'm sorry, not Kelly. <clears throat> Elizabeth uh, begins reading the letter uh, out loud for Gavin and Carter. Um, it is addressed, uh, it's addressed more as a to whom it may concern. Because Thomas doesn't know who Carter's partner is just yet. And he did the same thing for Kelly's uh, letter. And um, so it starts out like this. Uh, Hello. It snowed, it snowed last night. As she went on, her voice grew stronger. We weren't expecting it. Surprise, snow is my favorite snow. It's, it always has been. I woke early before everyone else. The compound was quiet, daybreak still an hour or two away. There's something magnificently strange about snowfall at night. The air, feel, the air feels charged. The light is odd. It's this faint peach color. I'm entranced by it. I walked outside, and while most of the snowfall had passed, there were still flurries moving statically. It was because of this I decided it was time to write this letter. I can't explain why exactly. I felt this was a sign. Sometimes there isn't a rational explanation, even if we want there to be one. It just feels right. So here I am, pen in hand, thinking of my oldest son. Carter is 15 years old, and like most boys his age, he's brash and awkward. He's growing into himself, but still apt to trip over his own feet. It makes me smile, but not because he tends to be a little graceless. No, I think it's because he simply exists at all. I was fortunate enough to be gifted three sons. They have made me a father. But it's Carter who made me a dad in the first place. And I would, and I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that. When one becomes a dad for the first time, it's terrifying. It's enthralling. It's unlike anything else in the world. Elizabeth will tell you I worried, that I fretted, that I was sure I was going to break him. I wish I could say that's an embellishment, but it wouldn't be. I worried and fretted and was convinced I would drop my child the first moment I had held him in my arms. Have you ever loved someone at first sight? I have. Four times, in fact. Elizabeth was the first though she will probably say it was more hormones than anything else, but I know what I know. When I saw her, I knew there was no one else for me. I was lost to her, and I never wanted to be found. The second time I fell in love was when Carter, was when Carter Bennett was born. He was so tiny, so fragile, so loud. Oh, he cried. He wailed. I thought there was something wrong with him. But then he was placed in my arms, and he just stopped he blinked and even though it was it's just projection on my part i would have sworn he knew me that he recognized me he stopped crying he stopped moving he just stared at me and i knew then that no matter what happened in his in this life no matter what we would face my wife and i made had made something so profound that it defied explanation love is strange that way you think you know what to expect, but when it hits you, it's forceful enough to shatter your entire world. I wasn't ready for him, and all that he would entail. I thought I was, but as I looked down at him, I knew that it was more than I ever thought possible. He was more. His brothers, my third and fourth loves, followed him, and though I love them all equally, I look back at the moment Carter came into the world as the culmination. He was born in a moment of great strife and loss and I was tethered by him. He gave me purpose. He gave me strength. I would like to tell you, whoever you are, about Carter. Here's what I know. He was never going to be Alpha. I never cared about that. He's more like me than his brothers are. That worries me. I've made mistakes. I've hurt people. 
though I didn't intend to. I hope he takes the better parts of me and leaves the rest behind. He is brave to a fault, reckless, though he's quick to apologize if he steps on anyone. He's also kind, and when he laughs, it's like the sun rising, warm and filled with life. Once when he was five years old, I found him on the roof of our house. He taped paper to his arms that he cut out in the shape of wings. I managed to pull him back before he could jump. I demanded to know what he was doing, my heart in my throat. He looked up at me, a quizzical expression on his face, and said, Daddy, I just wanted to fly like the birds. Why are you mad? I didn't know how to tell him that I'd never been more scared in my life. So instead, I just hugged him close and made him promise that he'd never do anything like that again. Two days later, I found him on the roof once more. We put locks on the windows after that. Carter is protective of those he considers his. No one touches his brothers and gets away with it. He'll pull himself between them. He'll put himself between them and danger without regard for his own well-being. He takes the role of the oldest seriously. When Joe was born, he wanted to take him everywhere. When, he, when we found him trying to lift Joe from his crib, we asked him what he was doing. He told us that he wanted Joe to sleep in his bed. When we reminded him that babies needed to be safe and that the crib was the best place for him, we thought the result, that we thought that had resolved the matter. The next night, we found Carter and Kelly in the crib with Joe, all three of them asleep, Joe between his brothers. We asked Carter the next morning why it was important for him. He said that he was the oldest, which meant Joe and Kelly needed to keep him safe. This was who Carter this is who Carter is. He will stand on a roof because he wants to be a bird. He will snap and snarl at anyone who looks at his brothers the wrong way. He's funny. Well, I think he's funny. Elizabeth doesn't quite always see it that way. He's smart, too. Smarter than people sometimes give him credit for. I'm sure all fathers think that of their children. But there's an intelligence in him. An undying spark of life that I hope is never extinguished. He's lovely. Every piece and part of him. I often find myself watching him, wondering about what goes through his head. He's not unknown to me, but there is a secret heart to him that not many get to see. Which brings me to you. I don't know who you are. I probably, hopefully, won't have to find out for a long time. And not because of you. I know that whoever you are, if my son has chosen you, and you have chosen him back, You've seen through all the noise and bluster that Secret Heart beats thunderously in his chest. If he has let you in, if he's dropped the facade of the cocky boy that he is, you are worthy. Completely and fully. Never doubt that. The road ahead won't, be easy, won't always be easy. There will be the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. But so long as you remember that he is a gift, then I know you will see the light that burns within him. He loves so big that it takes my breath away. There is no one like him in all the world, and he needs to be treasured. I don't know if he hears that enough. I try, as does his mother, but how can we even begin to bring words to, li to life to describe all that he entails? I hope you figured that out because he needs to know. He carries the weight of everything on his shoulders to his detriment. And I don't want him to carry that burden alone. Whoever you are, know this. Love him, and you will never have to be alone again. You will know joy. You will know happiness. You'll know that it means to be loved. What it, you'll know what it means to be loved unconditionally. I know this because I know him. I know joy. I know happiness. I know what it's like to struggle to breathe when his face lights up at the very sight of me. He is one of my great loves, and if he is yours, then you know what it then you know what I mean. Take his heart and hold it close. You will be rewarded far beyond anything you've ever known. And when you finish reading this, when you've taken in my words and absorbed them, come find me. I have more to tell you about him. So much more that I can't put it all down here. Nuances would be lost, and I want you to hear from me. Who are you? Someone special, I think. I take that back. I know you are special, because Carter Bennett thinks so too. Yours, Thomas Bennett. Aww. 
I've said it before and I said it again. A fictional character is a better father than my dad. Uh, Sorry to roast my own father on here, but, you know, as a grumpy old veteran, he will never say anything as profound and as loving as that. I can tell you that I right mean, now. Same. <laughs> same. Yeah. But. Yeah. But. Uh, the reason. So I just want to go ahead and <clears throat> explain why she decided to give him that letter then and there. Um, so Elizabeth decided to give Gavin and uh, Carter this letter because um, they are they got reports from the witches that there is trouble brewing at uh, with Livingstone. Uh, somehow he has begun gathering rogue werewolves to his cause, and even though he has been he's locked behind magical wards. Someone within the witch's ranks is letting these wolves in, and they're built, and they're slowly building, growing in numbers. They don't know who is letting these werewolves into uh, into Livingstone's prison, but they're trying hard to find them. So they know that the final confrontation with Livingstone is coming, and they need to make sure that Gavin and Carter have everything they need because they're because Livingstone will try to use uh, Gavin. We'll try to uh, sway Gavin back to his side. Um, let's see here. Do -do. Uh, not long after this, uh, Ox decides to go back, uh, go to Livingstone's prison to uh, try to help the witches determine who the traitor is, and to get uh, and to make sure that Livingstone and his supporters don't escape. Uh, Carter and Gavin, they do finally uh, pull their heads out of their asses and uh, become mates, uh, cue the spicy scenes and shit. Uh, uh, but we're not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on the good shit. Uh, Livingstone, as it turns out, had been getting help from a young witch that uh, he was able to influence while, during his time in Caswell. Uh, this young 15-year-old witch, uh, Livingstone, had tattooed um, pretty much the same kind of magical tattoos that he had tattooed on his own son, Gordo. And this gave this young witch access to stronger magics, as well as the ability to, uh, as, as well as the ability to influence the wards surrounding Green Creek. So this young witch was able to bring down the wards containing Livingstone and him and his army, uh, his small army of, war of werewolves escape and they uh, they briefly fight Ox and the witches that were containing Livingstone. A lot of them end up dying and Ox is hurt, but he's okay. He manages to call ahead and warn the rest of uh, Green Creek that Livingstone is coming and that Ox will be returning uh, to Green Creek uh, as quickly as he can. He's also going to be give, uh, sending out a call to the other wolf packs, the ones that still support the Bennets, and call for uh, extra support in fighting Livingstone. Uh, so from here, the Bennets begin preparing Green Creek for the oncoming attack. Uh, because the citizens there all know about werewolves now, uh, they've been... Uh, building up the defenses around their town. So now they do have anti-werewolf defenses, mainly like uh, silver traps and things like that, and silver-based weapons. Uh, so a lot of the citizens, they set up around this town. They put silver dust on the sidewalks. They set up silver traps. Uh, they pull out the silver bullets and shit. And um, the Bennets, uh, since they're going to be fighting their wolf forms, they use these little blinking lights that they attach to their ears. So when they're in their wolf forms, if the uh, people of Green Creek see those little blinking lights on their ear, they know that that's a friendly wolf. Yeah. Uh, so the attack begins. Livingstone attack, uh, invades the town, and his allied wolves begin attacking it uh, indiscriminately. Uh, but he wasn't prepared for the people of Green Creek being prepared for werewolves. So, despite the fact that the 
Livingstone's attack is pretty much is very overwhelming for him. Uh, they're able to hold off the the attack. Uh, Livingstone himself uh, kills several people and severely injures a few more people. Uh, but his allies are quickly overwhelmed by the Bennets as well as the allies of the Bennets who managed to arrive to help them fight off the attack. Uh, during a brief interlude in the fight, the Bennets return, uh, gather in their, uh, in their home out, uh, deeper within their territory and lure, uh, Livingstone there. And it's there that they confront Living, uh, Livingstone head on. Uh, all of his allies are dead. The wolves that fought with him have been killed. The young witch that, uh, he had influenced had also been killed. Um, and it's a very brutal fight. Uh, it takes a lot, even with two alphas and a whole pack of werewolves. Livingstone is very strong, uh, but they managed to wear him down until the point there was time for them to uh, to land the finishing blow. Ox ends up killing Livingstone. He basically just he uh, he snaps his neck and rips his jaw off, but. Livingstone ends up dealing a mortal blow to Ox, nearly killing him. Mm. Which, I know, I was like, no, no, please, God, no. Don't tell me. Oh, my God. If he dies, I I'm going to be livid. Like, I will, I will fucking riot. I will riot <laughs> if Ox dies. Because Ox is a sweetheart. He doesn't deserve that. And this is the second time a werewolf punched straight through his fucking chest. God damn it. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it's like, what did, what did this poor boy do to you? I mean... It's like, so that's so personal. Yeah. But, either way, Ox manages to kill Livingstone, and Ox is gravely injured, and he nearly dies. Uh, but the witches that are supporting, uh, that are supporting the Bennets, they tell them that there is a way to heal Ox, uh, because... The thing is, is that Green Creek, it has been the home of the Bennett family for centuries. All right. There is a there is a deep magic there. It's very strong. It welcomes, it protects the Bennetts. And uh, because of everything that the Bennetts have been through for the, within the past two decades, from Richard Collins attacking to Livingstone to the Hunters, um, this is something that has been happening for no, I'm sorry, not not two decades. I'm sorry, no, this is just like this has been like one thing after the uh, it's been one thing after another. The hunters attacking the Bennets like well over thirty years ago, like almost like yeah, thirty years ago, forcing them to leave their home, and then they come back, and then ro a rogue werewolf comes and, a and attacks them again, and then the hunters come back, and then more werewolves and witches and shit. It's just one thing after the other. And every time the Bennets have done everything they could to defend their home, they're, they've shed their blood there, they've lived there, they've died there, and this land, the land has just become so much of a part of them that now that this final enemy has been defeated, like, after, after Livingstone, they have no more enemies. That's it. Yeah. Done deal. It started with Livingstone, and it ended with him. So the witches reveal that the magic of the land is willing to give back to them now. Like uh, certain conditions have been met that the that the land will help them somehow. Um, but they need to do several things. For one thing, they need to really. Uh, it, mainly, it has to do with what Joe needs to do, mm -hmm. not only as Ox's mate, but also as an alpha, because. Alphas can actually save the life of their of another wolf, but it involves giving up their alpha powers and transferring it into that wolf. Yeah. So they basically cease being an alpha while that other wolf will take on the role of the alpha. And the thing is, Ox and Joe, they were both alphas, but seeing as that Ox just got is dying, he lost his alpha powers. So Joe needs to transfer his power into into Ox. Um, so Joe agrees without hesitation and uh, prepares to 
uh, he prepares to transfer his power into Joe. I'm sorry, into Ox. Uh, the witches they cast a spell and begin drawing on uh, drawing on the uh, territory's magic, and began healing Ox at least enough to get him to like to bring him back from the brink of death, so that way Joe can transfer his power. Um, when they do this, the entire Bennett pack is drawn into this sort of like spiritual world. Um, it's still the spirit world reflects Green Creek, so the forests, the tree, the clearings, everything. It's their territory, but more spiritual. Um, but it's weird because uh, there there is a special clearing that the Bennets have, where they have a lot of their gatherings as wolves. Whenever they uh, whenever they turn during the full moon, it's that clearing that they often go to. Um, but in this clearing, in the spirit world, it's much bigger and it's filled with these doors. And through each door is a memory. Now, the witches warn them that they'll see these they'll see these doors, but they must not go into them because if they do, they won't be able to come back. But it's very tempting because they're seeing memories as they've happened in the past, and they really it's tempting to like want to go through them and try to like change things because they they're tempted to want to change things. But the Bennett family they manage to ignore it and they push through. Uh, until they finally find Ox waiting for them at a uh, a door of his own. Um, they're happy to find him, and Ox, uh, he tells them a bit about his life story. Oxford, uh, Oxnard Matheson was told by his dad that he will get shit for the rest of his life for anything. He was basically taught that he had little to no worth in life. And that no matter what he does, he will not amount to anything. But then he meets, he, but then Ox met a, a little boy on the dirt road leading to his home. A little boy that, swar that swarmed him, jumped, started climbing all over him, telling him about how he smells like Candy canes and pine cones, epic and awesome. And how suddenly Ox was pulled into a family. He found himself with a new family. Because before it was just him and his mom. Yeah. But then he met but then he met that little that that little boy and that and that little boy's family. And his life changed. He suddenly had three new brothers, a second mom and a real father because at the end of the day ox considered thomas bennett to be his father because thomas bennett acted like it he took him in he welcomed him into the family he brought him into the world of were of werewolves and he did so much for him and his mother and it honestly, I, I had a moment while he was talking to he was telling his family this stuff that I thought, oh, is he gonna die? Is this all for nothing? This sounds like a goodbye. Don't do this to me. Uh -oh. But <laughs> no, but it it was there was a point there was a purpose to this. It was his way of thanking his family and reaffirming that they made him who he is, and he wouldn't change anything. Um, and since they're in this spiritual world, they are reunited with the spirit of Thomas Bennett. Um, Thomas is not in his human form. He's in this world. He is in his wolf form. And for one final time, they're able to run with their, uh, with their father once again. And they also meet the spirits of other family members that have long since died, like, uh, uh, Thomas's father Abel and many other wolves from their family, and they run as a pack within the spirit world. And it's I'm like, man, this is just this is a beautiful thing. Um, but finally, they are drawn out of the spirit world, and uh, in order for Ox to take on uh, Joe's alpha power, he does have to pierce Joe's heart and with his with his claws so he ends up doing that it doesn't kill joe um because i know being getting stabbed through the heart is not a good thing but uh that's how it's how the transfer of power is done 
So Ox does that. He take he ends up taking Joe's alpha power for himself. Uh, Joe is uh, I don't want to say reduced, but that's the only word I can think of right now. Is he's a uh, reduced to uh, a beta. So his eyes turn from the crimson red to this brilliant orange color. And Ox now becomes the sole alpha of the Bennett pack. Um, the story begins to wind after this. The story begins to conclude. Uh, the Bennets are able to finally return to their to to an actual normal life, because for the better part of two decades, they were always living with this with something hanging over their heads. If it wasn't a rogue werewolf, it was an it was a nefarious evil witch and a enemy alpha or, or hell fucking werewolf hunters. But now all of that has been taken care of. Uh, the Bennets end up giving up their role as uh, the ruling pack of all of the other packs. Um, Ox and Joe approach a, uh, a friendly alpha that they knew that they uh and they asked him to take on the role of the alpha of alphas and they agree um gavin and carter their relationship begins to grow and they're able to finally find peace together like gavin being uh now a f carter's full mate he's no longer an omega and he's now a beta and he's able to he's finally able to recover uh, fully from the effects of a, of being an Omega. Um, he's, his, he's still having a hard time forming coherent words, uh, but he's getting better. And uh, the book ends with the Bennett family going for their monthly run as wolves during the full moon. And that is the conclusion of the Green Creek novels. And the conclusion of Brother Song. Dun dun dun. It's more of all. It's more. It's not so much of a dun dun dun, and more of like that. Uh, God, what's that song at the end of? Uh, they usually play it at the end of Star Wars. It's like a high. It's very melodious and. Like kind of sad, but also like hopeful. Oh God, what's it called? I think it was a John Williams song. No clue. Either way, uh, it's not really important. But uh, since this is the conclusion of the Green Creek books, um, there is no epilogue, but there is one final chapter. And uh, this final chapter is the it's just the letter. That Thomas Benton, uh, that Thomas Bennett had written to uh, Joe's future partner. So this is the third letter, and uh, let me tell you something. When I finished this book, and I, you know, I got to the last page, read the last word, I'm like, oh, it's over. God, I don't know what to do with my life now. And then I turn the page, and the first thing I see is the head is the title of this final ch of this next chapter and it said to joe's future and the letter starts off with hello ox and oh. when i when i when i read that i was like no oh my god no 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 no! i'm not ready I, oh my god i'm not ready for this oh shit <laughs> i'm not ready i'm not emotionally prepared for this <laughs> i had like a little freak out i'm like no <laughs> hyperventilating like oh my god he did it, but he did. So, for a little bit of context, um, uh, Thomas had, of course, written three the three letters for his sons to give to their partners, um, and he had written them years before he had met Ox, but then. When he met Ox, and right from the beginning, he knew Ox was going to be a part of Joe's life as something more than just a friend. Uh, because that's just how the way werewolves work. And he decided that the original letter he had written for Joe's partner was not going to be enough. Because now he knows who Joe's future is going to be. 
and he felt that he needed to write something more uh more personal for his future son-in-law so without further ado i'm going to go ahead and read this letter and i may or may not cry because i reread it i read uh, just before we started recording it i reread it and i still cried so oh my god th- they're gonna be tears uh-uh. because th- let me tell you something this was this was so sweet this was like uh i have no words i'm just gonna go ahead and read it and i'm pretty sure you guys will uh, if you've read the books i'm pretty sure you felt the same if you haven't read them and and when i read this letter you it, I hope it like inspires you to go read through the books because there's just so much history that's put into this letter that you would only feel the way I feel after having going through this journey of reading this book and concluding with this final letter. Yeah. So to Joe, to Joe's future. Hello, Ox. Today is a good day, as good as any to put my thoughts down into words. But before I say what I need to say about my son, Joe, I need to tell you a story. Please forgive a father for his meandering thoughts. I am finding this harder than I expected it to be. I wrote you a letter once. Oh, not you specifically. It was meant for the idea of you. The one who Joe would choose to love. Would choose to spend his life with. I have done the same for Carter and Kelly though theirs will be less specific as I don't know what the future holds for them. The letter I wrote originally for whoever you would be now seems lacking and simply will not do. I'm writing this second letter because I know you now. You are 18 years old today. Soon you and Carter will be graduating high school and beginning the next stage of your life. And soon I will travel to Caswell to store this letter with the others I've written for Carter and Kelly's future until there comes a day, far from now, when it will be time for my words to be read. It seems as safe a place as any and is strangely fitting with all Joe will become. I worry about that. I worry that I haven't been the best father I could be to him. Expectation has a weight to it, heavy and cumbersome. Joe, as you are aware, will be an alpha. I remember what that was like for me, being told by my father at a very young age who I would become and that it would mean and what it would mean for me, for my family and for all the wolves. While I know this is the way of things, I can't help but think I'd take this burden from him if I could. The mark of a good parent is that they always want the best for their their children, putting their needs above all others. Am I doing the right thing? I wrestle with that thought constantly. Lizzie says I underestimate him. She may be right. She usually she usually is. Still, there are days when I wonder if this life, this purpose, is something Joe truly wants. He says he does, but I think it's because I'm his father and he wants to make me proud. Does he know I would be proud of him regardless? I hope so. I tell him as much as often as I can and as I do my other sons. Here's what I know about Joe. He was born and I was terrified. I didn't know how it was possible for me to make more room in my heart for him. I thought I'd have to lose the parts meant for Carter and Kelly, especially when we realized that Joe was different from his brothers. I I needn't have worry, Not not about that at least. There was much to my surprise and joy, more than enough room for him. He carved himself a place within me tucked neatly between my wife, my brother, and Carter and Kelly. He didn't cry when I held him for the first time. Lizzie tell Lizzie will tell you I was frantic about it. I could scoff and tell you I was I most certainly wasn't, but that would be a lie. He watched me with those big eyes of his, and I was lost to him. As you know, he was taken from us. I blame myself for that. I was blinded by the belief that I could see the good in the people I chose to surround myself with, people I trusted. That was a mistake, and not my first nor my last. I cannot begin to describe the terror that filled those weeks. It would take a much greater man than I to ever put all those feelings into words. 
so I will say the bare minimum. The man who dared to touch my son deserves no more than that. Joe was returned to us, and he was a shell of who he used to be. I tried everything, begging, crying, shouting, holding him, loving him, whispering little things into his ear. Nothing worked. As a last ditch, as a last ditch effort, I gave up all that I'd worked for. It was the easiest decision I've ever made. We returned to Green Creek, the home I'd loved and cherished. I hoped the territory would allow Joe to heal. I should have known that it wouldn't be enough. It didn't need to be, because the most remarkable thing happened. You came into our world. You know what happened next? There is no need to rehash that here. I have much to tell you, and the hour grows late. Joe made his choice. I should have stopped him, but I couldn't, and for that, I'm sorry. You didn't know what it meant, the gifting of a, wolf's, of a wolf of stone, and how could you? For all you knew, we were just a normal family, and there was something so terribly wonderful about that. We did not do right by you. In fact, it could be argued that we took advantage of you. I don't know if that makes me any better than the man who hurt my son in the first place. I'm sorry. Joe is kind. His empathy for all things is staggering. Once when he was four years old, he found a wounded bird in the forest surrounding Caswell. He came to me in tears, asking me why the bird couldn't fly away and be with his friends. I told him that was something the way that was sometimes the way of things, that for all the beauty in the world there would there were harsh lessons to be heard. The bird would most likely not survive. I tried to take it from him, but from the shoebox he put it in, but he wouldn't let me. He said he would help it heal, that he would take care of it until I could return it until it could return to the sky. And he did. He did just that. For weeks he was diligent in its care. He fed it, gave it water. His mother helped him weave a little nest of twigs and bits of string. I prepared for the day the bird died, ready to impart on my son the cruel but necessary lesson of death and all its entails. The bird healed. It gained strength, and on a sunny day he took it outside. He set the box on the ground and told it that it was free, that it could go home. It did. It flew away. Joe watched it until it disappeared into the trees. Then he turned to me and said, See, Daddy? See? It just takes time. How momentous that moment was. How humbling. It, takes, it just takes time. I've never forgotten the lesson my son taught me. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your, rea in your philosophy. Joe is sarcastic, a byproduct of his brothers. If God exists, he or she must have a sharp sense of humor to give me such mouthy children. They are aggravating and make me want to pull out my hair at times. But then they'll look at me with the same eyes as their mother, and I'll know they are our greatest creation. He's quick and smart, more so than I gave him credit for. He will make a good alpha, and I wish he could be anything else. I often wondered who would see him for who he truly was. Who would see beyond the title, beyond the crown, to the very heart of him. I could never have expected it would be someone like you. I know you, Oxnard Matheson. I know you. But there are times I still wonder who you are. How did you become the man I saw just this morning? How did you prevail over all life through in your path? I won't be so self-centered to think we played a major part in any of it. No, that honor goes to your mother. She, like you, like Joe, weathered all that was flung upon her and still made it through to the other side. And what's more, she did it because she knew you were counting on her to do so. I hope you realize that. Once you finish this letter, and if you haven't done so already, tell her you love her. We never know when it could be the last time we can say such things. Whatever you decide, I know you'll be part of Joe's life, and he will be grateful for it. 
You are your own man, and the world is a wild and wonderful place. I just hope you remember that no matter where your travels take you, we'll be waiting here for you if you ever decide to come back. Who are you? How are you the way you are? There is no magic in your blood, no wolf underneath your skin, and yet I see you and I think only one thing. Alpha. It, is it the immensity of your heart? The strength of your humanity? I know not. But I don't think it matters, even if it's a mystery I wish to solve. Beyond that, I am struck by a simple yet powerful desire. I would have you call me father, if you could. For you are my son, just as Carter is, just as Kelly is, just as Joe is. It would be a great privilege. I understand, if that's not something you can do, it's a lot for anyone to ask. But know that this desire is not contingent upon whatever you, decision you make, be it Joe or whoever you choose. I will always be here, ready and waiting. Which is why I must say this last. I dream of a future where everything is joy and nothing hurts. Life doesn't work that way. If all we knew was joy, we would lose appreciation for the quiet moments whose profundity can be overlooked. Oh, but I dream of such a day regardless. I don't know what the future holds for us. Much is hidden from me. There are people who would take all that I have built. They've tried before and almost succeeded. I've seen destruction in its many forms. I held my father as he took his last breath, my claws in his heart to accept a gift I wasn't ready to, see, to receive. I looked into the eyes of a beast as he promised me his loyalty. I stood by a witch whose heart and mind were twisted as he embedded marks into the skin of his son. And it was the same son that I failed when I took everything away from him, worried that he was more like his father than I thought. Destruction in its many forms. It comes for us when we least expect it, from a direction we never thought possible. You have a part to play, though I hope I'm wrong. And I would keep it from you as long as I'm able. You don't deserve to suffer from the mistakes of others. None of you do. I've thought more than once of keeping you from this, to shun you, to send you away. What does that make me? I don't know. What does it mean that I can't find the strength to do so? I don't know that either. Damned? That sounds like it could be right. Damned either way. I will do what I can to prepare you for whatever may come. I will give you my everything, because that is what a father must do. You've heard me say that an alpha puts the needs of his pack above all others. You are my pack, Ox. You've been from the beginning. I was wrong earlier, when I said there was no magic in your blood. I was wrong when I said there was no wolf underneath your skin. You are magic. You are wolf, more than I ever thought possible. Joe saw that before the rest of us. Whatever light burns within you, it burns bright, and I can't help but want to bask in it. One day, I hope you'll see what the rest of us do. You are light, my son, my, wonder, my wondrous child, and I am so very happy to know you. I expect when you finally read this letter, I'll be waiting nervously to hear your thoughts. I'll wonder if, you think, if you'll think I'm just a silly old man writing pretty words. Maybe you'll laugh at me, though it won't be cruel. Maybe you won't be ready to see what I see, and that's okay. We have time. Or maybe you'll come to me on a sunny day, much like today, and you'll look upon me in that quiet way you do. You'll take my hand in yours, and you'll call me Father. Oh, what a wonderful day that would be. It's getting late. The sun is setting. The door to my office is open, and I can hear Lizzie singing in the, in the kitchen. Mark is on the front porch, drinking from a mug of spicy tea. Carter and Kelly are in the backyard. They're laughing, laughing, laughing. And just now, I looked out the window to see you and Joe walking down the dirt road toward the house at the end of the lane. You were smiling, and Joe is looking at you as if you are the moon itself. I can't think of a more perfect moment. It's time to bring my ramblings to an end. I'll finish by saying this. I don't know what the future holds, what sacrifices we must make, but I believe with all my heart and soul that my dream of joy is within our, our grasp, so long as we are brave enough to reach for it. 
I love you all more than anything. And I will always, and I always will. Eternally yours, Thomas Bennett. Sorry, choked up there for a second. Like, God damn it. Get it together. <laughs> okay. No. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Never. <laughs> that was cute. Yeah. <laughs> um, I got so emotionally invested into this book. The elements of family, both blood and found is so strong and is such a big part of the story. And even though Thomas died in the first book, there there was still enough of the story to like get an idea of the kind of person he was. And you know, they his family is often remorsed by him because of the mistakes he's made that have affected them. But they love they loved him and miss him regardless and you know reading this book is like it's almost like you're part i felt like i was almost like i was a part of this story i was able to put myself in these characters shoes i was able to see like how wonderful the people were the characters were and just reading this last letter that thomas wrote for joe for ox it was just so deeply personal and like i just kept thinking about like you know just the little references that that the author put in the letter and you know just thinking back like oh yeah that happened in this scene like oh yeah that happened and it is you know heart-wrenching but it is these books were definitely worth the read mm. uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know yeah yeah you know people you know have their uh, everyone has their tastes yeah not everybody's gonna like werewolf romance and shit you guys probably need to stay off a of wattpad oh. but uh it is definitely worth the read um if they ever adapt this into a movie i'm definitely going to be one of the i'm definitely going to be one of the first people to go see it um i just hope that uh i hate to admit it but i think summit entertainment should do it cuz yes those are the those I mean, are the guys summit that... entertainment probably would do it <laughs> yeah cuz yes those are the guys that produce the twilight films but the difference between Twilight and Green Creek is the werewolves in Green Creek are actual werewolves. They're badass. And it's not all about like some lovey, sappy, uh, like obsession. There's so much more to it. There's family, there's connections, there's community. And mm -hmm. I, I just love it. And you know, I hope one day someone decides to make a movie out of it, if they ever do. Because um, let me see, when was this book released? Um, when in doubt, Jacob, go to the book itself. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe this one, well, it says it was copyrighted, uh, 2020 by Travis Clune. Uh, so I'm assuming that's when it was released. It was released October 7, 2020. Yeah. Yep. That was the last so, book. Yep. And now the other book, the first book that was released back in uh, publishing time, September first, twenty twenty two. What? 
Unless it's talking about the. That's weird. Bring group. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Um, it was. I think it was in 2016 when it was written. Because I just found an article about it, and that article was written. Cause I'm, yeah, because I'm looking up the books, and it's saying... Oh, okay. It says, first published June 20th, 2016. 2016? Yes. I guess that's them doing the... Was this them doing the physical releases? Because they did... I'm looking it up. It's a like Wolf Song 2020, uh, 2023, Raven Song 2018, Heart Song 2019, and Brother Song 2020. So I'm like, well, That's the cool. the current covers that it has, like um, these editions, are uh, those were released recently, like 2022. But mm-hmm. everything else, uh, yeah. So Wolf Song was originally published. Um, June twenty uh June twentieth, twenty sixteen by Dream Spinner Press. Um I believe it was originally released on Kindle first before it was printed. Yeah. You just said yeah. Yeah. Eh. It's kind of, these books are like since these are like indie pretty indie. It's kinda of hard to find more information about them because you know they're not really published by like those big publishing companies so yeah those tend to be a little bit harder to track down but other, anyway um this is definitely a i think this is a must read if you really like um if you really like i don't want to say this is romance because it wasn't really high on the romance it was more of like uh, a love story because we saw because in each uh, the whole story for each partner, it always started well before like their relationship always started well before they actually fell in love and got together. It always started off as something more platonic and uh, like in Joe and uh, Ox's case, it was more of like they became brothers yeah. And of course, like since Ox was like six years older than Joe, and Joe was only ten when he first met him, nothing was going to happen, not for a long time, not for another ten years at least. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so if you like werewolves, but if you want to like take a step away from just like the mindless action and horror aspect of werewolves and go into something more. Uh, it's. I'd still say this is fantasy, and this is definitely. Uh, and it is fall. It does fall under the romance category, but it's more of a love story. And there's still a lot more. Uh, world building, a lot more. Uh, relationship building, aside from just romance, it is definitely a good read. Awesome. It's wholesome. That is that's the word I'm looking for. It's more. It's very wholesome. Uh, I love it. I'm sad that it's that I finished reading it as quickly as I did. But, but you know, when I find a good book, I inhale that book. I just read the fuck out of that book without mercy. And, Period. Uh, I definitely recommend uh, reading it. Kindle editions are the Kindle editions are pretty cheap. Um, I think since li- recently, since they republished the books with the new covers, they've gone up in price. So they're about like somewhere between five to eight bucks on Kindle. Um, I definitely recommend just like give the first book a shot, uh, and if you like it, then you have the reviews for the next three books here and yeah. how, how much. I, as the reader, love them. And I've already gotten several of my friends to read them, and they all agree that these are so good. And, yeah. you know, there's one friend, you know, 
I'm trying to get to read, but he needs to finish reading another book before he can move on. Are you talking about me? <laughs> well, whatever, whatever gave you that idea. He's pointed. <laughs> no, you're right. Which you're reminds, right. but what? Which reminds me, how's the how's fairy tale coming? It's 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 coming. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. I'm gonna have it right 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 now. Yes, I'm gonna have I'm gonna have it right for next week. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Told you mm-hmm. I would. Okay. Uh huh. Mhm. 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 Yep. Uh-huh. <laughs> He's not going to have it by next week. <laughs> oh my god, yes I am. <laughs> okay. Oh All right. My god. <laughs> All right. Well, that's enough of that. Thanks guys for listening in to our review of The Green Creek Chronicles. It was a wholesome journey for me. I might end up going back and just rereading it just because of how much I love the story. Um but thank you guys. Hope you guys enjoy the book as much as I did. And catch us next week. We will be hopefully reviewing Fairy we Tale. We will by... be talking about fa- Fairy Tale by Stephen King. Yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> yes. Just going to be giving okay. you the side eye that until then. <laughs> like the best big side eye. Criminal side eye. Criminal offense side eye, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now we'll be doing fairy tale for Stephen King next week. I'm excited. All right. Until then, catch y'all next time. Bye. Bye.